Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us in from different places all around, around the world. This is really nice. Um, I'm really excited about this, um, having this meetup going online to have all of these types of uh, like people from all over and, and I'm super excited to have you all here and to have the amazing speakers with us today. Um, so, well, the, the GenStack, the meetups are part of a global community. Um, we are the ones from Porto in Portugal. Uh, we started doing meetups uh, here in Porto and well, since, March, uh, we shift a bit to online because we didn't want to 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 lose um, the community. And actually, we we understood that it was um, very nice to a nice opportunity to organize online meetups because we can have people speaking from all uh, all over the world to share it with the community and of course continue to have uh, people from Porto and from Portugal joining us. But also, um, but also having um, people from 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 different places. So uh, you see that you have meetups all over uh, Europe and the States and Asia and so on. So um, this is really nice. So uh, this is another thing uh, important. So it's a global community, and if you are not yet on Slack. Join Slack, go at genstack.org uh, slash community. Um, and then you can have access to this to Slack. There, there's lots of of, um, of discussions. If you have any doubts, pe people are really uh, willing to help and, and, and contribute to things that you're working on. There's also the Genstack Conf Twitter that there's um, uh, stuff uh, going on over there too. So joins like it's really nice. Um, this uh, edition of the um, of meetup, so the Porto edition of the the, the Jamstack meetup, is organized by me, <laughs> Anna, and um, on behalf of uh, Marzi Labs, which is um, a web development company. We've been working with Jamstack for quite some years now, and. Uh, we are super excited to help uh, to share knowledge, to help people have a place where they can share knowledge, and super excited to 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 take uh, to organize this. Um, we are always looking for people to share knowledge and to come speak at the Genstack meetup. Um, so if you want to share something cool that you're working on or um, to present a case study and so on, you can um, drop us a, a, a message or uh, submit uh, a talk in a, a form that we have open in, in, the, um, in the meetup. Also, all of the editions, even the, the previous ones are available on a YouTube channel. Just, just look for Genstack Op Opeo uh, Meetup. There you have uh, all the videos, all of the recordings. This one is also going to be um, recorded. So in the following days, you, you, if you want to rewatch or if you want to share with someone in your team that to watch it, you can go there and share it. Um, just a couple of uh, announcements. So the next meetups uh, are going to, to happen in the following months. So uh, save the date already for 23rd of November, we still are confirming um, the, the speaker. And on the 14th of December, we will have Anthony Campolo talking and, and building full stack and stack with Redwood JS. So we're super excited with that. Um, so yeah, already save the date and, and join us for the next uh, for the next event. Uh, so yeah, today this is what's uh, about me, about the presentation, and uh, about the, the meetup. Uh, thank you so much, everyone that is here, and a special thank you to Thomas and to Rachel for joining us and for sharing their knowledge and, and for uh, coming here to, to speak for us. 
So um, we will start uh, with uh, Thomas. Uh, he's going to talk about the importance of media and APIs in the ZenStack. And so after his talk, we'll leave um, a few a few minutes for questions. So if you if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and leave it in the chat. So after his presentation, we can um, we can we can make them to him. And after his uh, his presentation, we'll have uh, Rachel. He's going she's going to show her, us how to go headless with Gatsby, Netlify, and B Commerce. Super excited for for her for, for her talk. Uh, and the same after uh, her presentation, she will answer questions. So if you have any questions, go ahead and and ship them on the on the chat box. So thank you so much. Thomas, I'll leave the floor to you now. <laughs> Thank you, and good evening, afternoon, morning to, to you all, wherever you may be. So let me try to show myself to you. I'm not sure whether I'm visible. Um, hopefully yes, I am, we... and I am. I am perfect with my spooky Halloween Exactly. Background <laughs> kind of thing. Um, let me also share my screen so that we can all see this wonderful screen in front of me as well. Cool. So I need to move everyone away from here. And this is, hang on, I'll get there. I need to do that. And now we're good to go. So again, hello, everyone. Uh, good, good evening to you all. Um, let me introduce myself real quick so you can now see me in double. So my name is Tamash. Um, I work as a developer evangelist at um, Cloudinary. I also have uh, my own business, which is called Full Stack Training, uh, where I deliver some trainings and, and workshops to the interested parties. And I also, <clears throat> excuse me, happen to be a Google developer expert in, in web technologies. So as you know, Anna said, you're going to have time to to do a quick q a so if you have any questions about anything that i talked about you can put it in the chat but if at a later point in time something comes up and you you know want to have a discussion about it you see the twitter handle on this slide so feel free to uh to reach out to me via twitter and i'll be more than happy to uh to help you with any uh questions that you may have so today we're going to talk about the importance of um, media and APIs in the context of the Jamstack. Uh, I see a notification here, so let me just try to open um, the chat panel if I can separately, so I see if we have any questions in the meantime. There we go, and back to play. Okay, so I see questions now as well. Cloud and media developer expert here, excellent, good stuff. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? Media and the Jamstack, right? Now, I picked a few websites that I'm going to show you some stats. Those were absolutely random, okay? So I, I don't want to pick on any website. I don't have any, you know, I don't hold any grudges against any of these websites. They were picked randomly, okay? So hopefully, you know, all the people who are here, you know what the Jamstack is already, right? So in my opinion, the Jamstack is, is really an architecture that is or was designed to bring better experience to the web. And the better experience is achieved by the creation of these fast and secure sites, you know, these pre-rendered HTML placed on edge servers, placed on the CDN servers, right? So the Jamstack utilizes these static site generators to create in inverted commas static pages um, which are pages generated at build time so that these HTML pages can be put to edge servers, to CDN servers, so that they can be distributed globally. People can access those in the fastest way possible, right? That's the whole purpose why we have the things like Gatsby and 11T and, and all the others. So basically, simplifying this, what we say is that CDNs and or plus a pre-built HTML or a set of pre-built HTML files equals to fast sites, right? That's the, that's the basic math that, that we're going to, to start from, or the basic formula that we're going to start from. And, you know, just 
talk about fast sites, there are there's actually a competition going on. So I'm I'm not sure how many of you uh, maybe entered your website there or how many of you actually know about this. But there is this thing called Speedify, uh, which you can access on that URL that I, I specified, which basically uh, runs, I believe, Lighthouse scores against uh, the websites that are on that list and it ranks them according to how fast they load, you know, the best practices they have and some other parameters. And what I've done, I run this curl command against, as I said, just random sites, is just to see the, whether the site returns a server in the request, uh, sorry, in the response object, right? So whether I can tell if the site in question is actually deployed on one of these CDN servers that we're talking about, right? So the first one at the time of creating these slides, which was, you know, this week, uh, the accessibility project, so a11yproject.com was at the first place and the server that it returns is Netlify. That means that this project is deployed using Netlify on Netlify servers. And we all know that Netlify uses their own, you know, set of CDNs to distribute the content. So that's, that's check, right? That's, a fast website running on a CDN. Then we have, you know, another random pick, austinjavascript.com. Um, the server that it runs on is Cloudflare. Okay, Cloudflare again is a CDN. So that's again uh, a check. We have Cloudycam, which is, you know, something that uh, we develop, developed at Cloudinary that is deployed using Vercel. So the server uh, property is, of course, going to be Vercel, meaning that again, we have a site that is. Uh, deployed on a CDN. So probably at this point, you're thinking, okay, we get it. Sites are deployed on CDNs and they make them fast. You know, that's, that's pretty straightforward. This is the core of the Jamstack. So the question is, if you have these, you know, very fast sites on the CDN and they serve these pre-generated static pages, what happens if you add media to these pages? What happens when you want to add images to these pages? What happens when you want to add videos to these pages, right? How will that affect your site? How is your site load time going to be affected? What is going to happen when images and videos and other media assets are added to your site? That is the question. And, you know, there's no denying in the fact that the, the web that we use today and the web as we know it today is visual. Right, so there's, uh, I'm not sure when was the last time you went on a website and there wasn't an image or, or even a video now, right? And there's a lot of companies that run their businesses on the web, lots of e-commerce solutions. These solutions cannot exist without media. They cannot exist without photos, without videos. And in order to drive customer engagement, these companies um, who have a very, uh, important visual presence or web presence, they try to give even further visual information for their users in order to drive engagement, right? So if you think about, again, just an e-commerce website, which one would you prefer? A site that shows you an image about the product or a site that shows you six images of the product plus a video plus a 360 degree view of the product, right? You're definitely going to spend more time on the latter one and you're going to definitely be able to explore the product and probably going to be more willing to spend your money. Um, so I took this quote from the Web Almanac report from last year. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that report. It basically analyzes the web for uh, 2019 and there's a new edition coming later on this year to analyze the web for 2020. And I really liked this you know, this phrase from that report in the media chapter um, from, from last year's edition, which was virtually every web page depends on images, right? So every web page that we have uses, you know, smaller or larger amount of images. So what does that mean? That means that if we, you know, take a look at that site, even the, you know, the first site that I found, which was the accessibilityproject.com on the Speedify page, if I just use the Google Chrome DevTools and if I just filter for the images, just on the main page of the site, you can see that there were eight images, you know, a bunch of SVGs and JPEGs and PNGs loaded. And that was 593 kilobytes out of the total 800 kilobytes that got transferred. So the majority of the content that was displayed to me was images. 
And in fact, if we drill a little bit further, um, this is a screenshot from Speedlify, which you know you can expand on the statistics that they collect about the various sites. You can clearly see that the total, uh, that's the first column, which is kind of purplish. I'm not sure how well that's coming through, but there's this purplish column, which is called total. That, that's the total kilobytes for the site. That's the, the, you know, the, the effective size of your website. And if you take a look at the seven kilobytes of HTML, some CSS, some JavaScript, and then boom, you have images. And if you look at the charts, again, you can see that even for a, you know, a very simple website about accessibility, the amount of images you know, it's like three of, you know, three quarters almost of the entire uh, page load. Now, what if we take a look at, you know, like a, um, uh, an actual e-commerce site. Okay, so in this case, I loaded the product page of an e-commerce website, and you see there are 305 requests, which is, again, you know, I don't know what other requests they, they do, but if we filter that down to, to images, it's 131, so it's more than one third of the overall requests is images, JPEGs and, and other image types here, which means 2.4 megabytes out of the six is again, just images. So the question is, how can you maintain, or how you can still maintain a good performance score when you have a website that is media heavy, meaning that you have lots of images, maybe videos, how can you make sure that you can still maintain your performance score? How can you, you know, make sure that you're still, if you had your site on Speedlify, that you're still ranking in, I don't know, in top 10 or top three? So the, the answer to that is to try to leverage API providers for media assets. And I'm going to tell you why you should leverage API providers and why I'm not saying that you should do image optimization on your own, right? We're going to get to that in just a minute. So basically, remembering our formula, what we want to do now is we want to have you know the cdn and our pre-built html which we established that you know equals to fast websites but we want to add media assets ideally on a cdn as well so we want to add images and videos to the cdn as part of this equation as part of this formula and hopefully that is going to be equal to even faster sites right because having a visual experience and providing visual experience to users should not be at a cost of the user experience. It should not be at a cost of, you know, the load time being much uh, longer. And these are screenshots from the Lighthouse um, tool, which, you know, we can talk about uh, a little bit, but basically Lighthouse is, is part of the Chrome DevTools. It's also available as a standalone CLI tool, and it allows you to run a bunch of tests against your website, right? And if you do that, there may be a couple of things uh, that will, you know, pop up and I run the test against two different websites and you see there are a bunch of warnings and errors that Lighthouse is telling us and it says, hey, you should properly size your images. Hey, you should serve images in next gen formats. Hey, you should efficiently encode your images. Now, they also associate, uh, you know, estimated savings against those values. So if, if I properly size my images, I would say what I would say 1.28 seconds in that case. And the other case, I would say 1.72 seconds, right? So if you look at this, you're probably thinking, okay, properly sized images, serve images in next gen formats. What does that mean? And again, the reason why I'm saying that you should use an API to do image optimization and image transformation for you is because they take care of most of these things that you see here, right? For example, um, actually, I think I have an example, so I got to, uh, I'll conclude this thought in, in just a second. But the fact is, working with media, and again, media images or videos, is difficult. Why is it difficult? Well, if I just think about the image formats, we have JPEG files, but then under JPEG, we have JPEG 2000, we have WebP, we have PNG. So out of this list, for example, WebP is supported by Chrome and Firefox, but in all the versions of Safari, WebP is not supported. But then Safari tells you that if you want 
to serve optimized images, then you should give it a JPEG 2000 format. But of course, that format is not going to be understood by Edge and Chrome and the others. So basically what we're saying here is that if you want to use the best available image format for any given browser, you almost have to generate about two or three versions of the same image. And then you have to figure out the logic to serve that image for the right browser. And then we enter video where you have MP4, where you have AVI, where you have WebM. And again, WebM is supported by Chrome, but it's not supported by Safari. MP4 is supported by all, but then still Chrome says, if you send me WebM, which is you know web movie, I can optimize that much better than I could optimize an MP4. So mm, you see that there's a lot of, lot of things that you can do. Then you can also mess about with the DPR, the device pixel ratio for images, which says if you're looking at the retina screen, you should double or even triple the amount of pixels that you show. If it's a regular screen, you should not do that because then you're going to just serve way too many pixels. Then you have responsive images, lazy loading, you know, video streaming with HLS, adaptive streaming, et cetera, et cetera. So taking all of this into consideration, I think using an API provider that does most of these things or all of these things automatically for you, plus it also allows you to serve your images via uh, uh, images and videos on a CDN is much better than you trying to do this work on your own. And then you still need to figure out how to add those assets to, to the CDN, right? But there's a lot of work involved in here. So what I'm going to do is do a quick demo for you. And I'm going to close this and go to my browser first. And let me do a very simple demo. And then we're going to get into the Jamstack a bit in, in just a second. But hopefully you already see that you know, the A in the Jamstack is, you know, especially made for, for API providers. And hopefully you will see the, this whole story that I'm trying to uh, walk you through now. So very simple demo, right? We have this image, which is an image of, of this woman. I took this image, well, I didn't take this image, but I'm, I'm taking this image and I uploaded it to my cloud in your account. Okay, once you do that, you get a URL that looks like this. I'm not sure if I zoom in, whether it's going to be visible for you, but the URL looks like this. This is, let's call this the raw asset. The image was, you know, 500 and some kilobytes on my computer. And when I upload it to Cloudinary and when I request it, it is still 500 and, where did it go? 583 kilobytes in size. Okay, so the size, is pretty much the same. And if we check the content type, it is in fact a JPEG. Okay, so there's nothing special uh, in here. But what Cloudinary allows you to do, so first of all, this image as it is, is already on a, a global CDN. So if I'm requesting it from, from London, it's going to be returned to me from a data center close to me. But if you request it in, I don't know, there were people in Ecuador or in San Francisco, then it is going to be returned to you from your closest location. So that's already a win, right? We have an image in the CDN. But we should be able to optimize this image because, you know, this image is 583 kilobytes. That's large. That's, that's not going to be ideal. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to modify the URL and I'm just going to put F underscore auto in here. F underscore auto is going to be this sort of magical flag that is going to check the browser that you use uh, to open this image and based on that is going to serve the most optimal image format for the browser and it's also going to take the image content into consideration. So there are cases when actually generating a WebP image format is not as good as generating a JPEG or a PNG. Okay, so what Cloud Image does, it does all of this for you automatically. So what's going to happen if I hit enter? is that the image size went down from 583 kilobytes to just 50 kilobytes. And the reason for this is because on the server side, Cloudinary has generated a WebP image, even though there's a JPEG extension. So let's, you know, let that not confuse you. Um, what it returns is a WebP image. And again, this is the image that is now available globally on the Cloudinary CDN. 
And what's great about this is that if I copy this URL and if I open a Safari window and I open this image in Safari, and if I look at the network panel in Safari, and if I zoom in, then you already see that the document type, it was showing up before, but it's gone, so it's here. The content type is image JP2, which is not JPEG, well, it is JPEG, but it's JPEG 2000. So this is the most optimal image format for you to serve in Safari. And I didn't change anything. I just use the same URL everywhere, okay? Now, additional things that you can do is also just do a Q underscore auto. So this is going to reduce the quality of the image in a way that is not affecting the human eye. So what's happening here is that Cloud Engineering in the server side looks at this image and says, there are a lot of pixels that I can remove without having any visual deficiencies for the image. Okay, so there's no visual penalty for removing those pixels. But of course, the size, again, ran down from 49 or from 40, 48 kilobytes to just 32 kilobytes, okay? And it's still the same image. We didn't change the width, we didn't change the height. We just added these optimizations. And the, the power in these, you know, in these tools and these APIs is the fact that you can actually change the width and you can change the height of these images, right? So now this is 150 by 150 image, which absolutely makes no sense, but it's 2.8 kilobytes. But what makes sense though, is if I do crop a thumbnail and find the face and do a radius around it, and that will basically render me a sort of full blown 150 times 150 profile image which is 3.8 kilobytes. Okay, so there's a lot of things that we can do. And if I copy this uh, URL, it would be a JPEG 2000 in Safari, it would be a WebP in Chrome, so on and so forth. So how does this again enter the Jamstack? So I have another demo, which I have already started, I think, and we're going to do um, something uh, together live as well, but let me load this first. So localhost one, two, three, four, and I need to probably hide this panel. There we go. So hopefully you can see the image here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So what we have here, I want you to imagine that you are on a hypothetical e-commerce website. Okay, I, I haven't built the entire thing, but this, this is a, a product page on um, uh, an e-commerce website. And when you are on an e-commerce website, you know, you're selling a yellow t-shirt and then you're thinking, you know, as, as a e-commerce provider, you, you want to sell a red t-shirt, you want to sell a green t-shirt, you want to sell a blue t-shirt, right? So if you click on these, then you get a t-shirt that is now blue, that is green, that is purple. Now, believe it or not, I haven't taken these images, you know, four times or five times even with different colors. The color replacement is 100% dynamic. So in light of that, and I can show you the code as well, I need someone to write your favorite color using the hex notation, and then we're going to edit here. So give me your favorite color in hex. Okay, so there is, Steve was the first one, badass, nice one. Um, so that's like this, I don't know how to call it, let's call it green too, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to save this, I'm going to come to my index page and I'm going to just add a new button I'm going to call this green too, so that new button should appear here, right? It's right here. So I'm just going to click this. And what should happen theoretically is now we have that color applied to that T-shirt, okay? So we can do another test. So let's change this <laughs> badass color to, I don't know, I'm just going to type 65EA2D. Oh, come on, that's green again. Okay, so let's do like that. Okay, I, I don't know what color that is. Let's call that yellow-ish. 
and I'm going to add that here, yellowish, save. So we have it here, I'm going to click that. And that didn't work, okay. Of course a demo had to fail, yellowish, or I just do yellow, maybe that's the problem. Yellow, click, there we go. Okay, so now it's kind of yellow. So the point is that I'm applying these transformations to the base image and I don't need to keep on adding, uh, keep on making pictures of the same product. Furthermore, I can say, you know what, I'm going to apply because you know, you're a bunch of cool people here. Let's, you know, give 25% discount to, to this particular version of the t-shirt. So the question is, how am I going to apply that? Well, what about text overlays? So I'm just going to apply this discount. And now that minus 25% off the tax is also part of my image. And because we like our hosts from Porto, we want to apply their logo for trademark purposes. So I'm just going to click this logo. And now the logo is also watermarked on the image itself. And if I move this image around, hopefully you can see that everything is part of the image. I can just say copy image address, open a new tab, and this is the image that we have, right? All of that achieved via URL manipulation. So I, I can show that to you. So there's F auto, Q auto, there's the color replacement, there's the actual text overlay, and there is the logo of Marty Labs. Okay, so I can uh, build this by URL manipulation. Now I've chosen to use URL manipulation in the code sample for the purposes of this demo, but Cloudinary has JavaScript SDK, React SDK, Vue SDK, so you can plug that into a Gatsby project, a Nux project, a Next project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's one more example that I want to show you before um, we need to wrap up. And that is, right here. So let's do a video example as well. Let me get rid of that. So again, just, you know, sticking with sort of e-commerce, right? So let's say you, you basically, you know, sh show this video of your product, right? It's a beautiful video. You have this model waving the dress that costs 1000 pounds and you want to, you know, sell 10,000 of this and then retire on a yacht on the Mediterranean Sea or I don't know, right? Now, you realize that, of course, th the, this video is great, but what if someone tries to view this using a mobile, right? So you, you, you're thinking, okay, I need to now somehow sort of, you know, crop, uh, crop this video, uh, change the aspect ratio, et cetera, et cetera, and then shrink it down to, to a width. Now, I'm doing this in Cloudinary. Okay, so I'm going to shrink this video down to 800 um, uh, pixels in width, and I'm going to change the aspect ratio to be 916, right? So you get this sort of mobile view. But you realize that if you play, the, the model is kind of sometimes appears, but sometimes goes towards the edge, or the crop is really, really not working, especially when she's going to turn around and she's going to just, you know, show you the entire cloth, which is going to happen right now. And she's now, is the, you know, it's not even visible. So you become very sad because there goes your retirement idea. Now, what if I were to tell you that, again, you just add gravity auto to the video, and Cloudinary will automatically find the focus of the most interesting frames in the video and will always keep that in the middle of the crop. So you see, already when the video starts, the model is again in, in the center of the video. And most notably, when she's going to turn around with the dress, she's still going to be straight in the middle of the, the video, right? So you still see that even though you change the aspect ratio and even though you have uh, this, this sort of mobile view. So the point of all of this is that when it comes to, to the Jamstack and especially you know, media and, and the A bit of the Jamstack, I, I have this sort of saying, these are the two things that I, I teach and preach on every single workshop and every single presentation that I do is, 
A, stand on the shoulders of giants, and B, there's an API for that. And, and let's start with there's an API for that. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember the Apple TV advert from 2009. I put a link uh, uh, up here. Basically, they did this 30 second video of the new iPhone and they said, oh, do you want to check where you park your car? There's an app for that. Do you want to know the weather for your next you know, vacation? There's an app for that. And the conclusion was, hey, uh, there's an app for that. So in the same way, in the world of the Jamstack and with the vast number of APIs available for you, I guarantee that there's an API for something that you want to use. And to go back to the previous point, standing on the shoulders of giants means these API providers are domain experts, right? So at Cloudinary, the only thing that we work with is media. Therefore, we know how to work with media, how to optimize it, how to transform it, how to do this G auto magic with it. Um, or the zero is a you know, provider that does authentication. That's the only thing that they do. So these providers are sort of domain experts in their own fields. The whole infrastructure that they give to you, you know, it auto scales. You don't need to worry about load balancing. What matters to you is that you put your media to Cloudinary or to any other sort of CDM provider that does optimization and transformations and, and all this magic, and they take care of the rest. Inside your application, what you're going to get is very good scores because you know automatically you can generate all these next gen image formats, which you may not have heard of before, but just by adding F auto as a parameter, that is going to be taken care of for you automatically. So basically, there's no compromise in trying to bring a um, a media experience or a visual rich experience to your users and that's not going to hit when you um, uh, hit back at you when you're going to run a lighthouse core test. So uh, actually this is fresh from the news so we're wrapping up in, in two minutes. I'm not sure how many of you attended the Jamstack, uh, well, it wasn't the Jamstack comp, I'm sorry, it was the, the next JS comp by Vercel. Uh, they just announced an image component, right? So exactly in the light of this, they allow you to use Next.js to create you know, static pages, put it in a CDN, and they realized a lot of people use media and they didn't know what to do with it. So they created this image component, which means that using this image component and using, for example, the Cloudinary loader as part of this image component, you can actually leverage media in this Jamstack ecosystem. And you can still have your media served in Cloudinary, optimized, transformed, and still on a CDN as well. And on top of that, you can now run that site through Versal Analytics, which they also announced um, as part of their conference. So they give you a performance score as well for the, the site that you're running. So very exciting developments uh, at Versal. So a bunch of links, uh, hopefully these, uh, these slides are going to be shared with you. Um, there are a few demos that you can take a look at for Cloudinary. Uh, I also wrote a blog post kind of talking about, you know, this whole concept of API usage inside the, the, the Jamstack. Um, if you're ever curious about how well your website is, um, or, or how uh, good your website is with regards to your website speed test for images, there's webspeedtest.clouding.com, which will basically go through every single image on your website and it's going to give you a grade just like how web uh, speed test would grade your site on the HTML and the CSS and JavaScript content. We do the same for the images. And for those of you interested, you know, I mentioned this for cell analytics, which is built on top of Web Vitals, which is a kind of new, well, maybe six months old initiative from, from Google. Um, Web Vitals are basically metrics that are sort of new measurements that measure how well your site is performing. And Vercel Analytics actually implement some of those. And as part of Web Vitals, there's some information about images as well, like why it matters to have a width and the height of the images, or why it matters to serve images in the next gen formats. Okay, um, last thing that I want to uh, uh, show you or talk to you is this website that I run, which is called jamstack.training. Um, there are currently 10 free video courses about different aspects of the Jamstack. So I have a lot of students. I have, I think about 1,300, 1,400 students now. Um, 10 
distinctive separate courses about building something using the Jamstack. So for example, there's a course that says build an e-commerce site using Snipkart and Gatsby. Or there's another one that is, you know, just talks about the importance of serverless functions and how to deploy serverless functions using Netlify and Vercel in the Jamstack. So there's lots of courses, all of them are for free. So if you want to learn more, please go ahead and register. So again, the domain is just jamstack.training. And with that, obrigado for, for having me. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And I think I'll uh, open up the platform for questions. Mm. Obrigado a você. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, there's a couple of questions here. Um, there's one yeah. from Alex uh, at the beginning. What about embedded SVGs versus outside image? Is there a difference in performance for loading? There was quite some discussions around uh, these questions. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm trying to find the, the, the question. So it's, okay, so it's here. What about embedding as yes. outside? Is there a difference? In, so embedded versus outside images. And then Andre saying inline versus request, okay. Um, I think that would depend on, on the, what the outside image is. So I think there's a fine line where you have to, so SVG is good, but th there's a line after which SVGs don't make sense, right? So I'm not sure what the actual, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read all of that now. I see that there was a quite a lengthy discussion, but yeah, you're you know, SVGs right, are good Tom. for. Yeah, you're, you, you got the idea, Thomas, yeah. Okay, so, so, so basically, you know, SVGs are, are good for like charts and, and, and very smaller graphics, but you wouldn't want to deliver a, 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 you know, super complex piece of art or even a super complex logo as SVG. I mean, SVG is, is good because you can, you know, infinitely scroll, uh, scroll it and zoom in and out. But the question is, do you need that functionality? So always think about the functionality behind your image you know, and then make a decision whether you want to do SVG or, or not. And again, if it's, I don't know, a, um, a logo, do you, and it's very complex, you know, lots of lines, lots of curves, etc. that will create an SVG, which could be disproportionately large. So does it make sense to have that? Or would you just rather have, you know, a PNG and then maybe F auto and Q auto it, and then, you know, let's, a service like Cloudinary or some other service to optimize that for you based, based on the content. Remember all these services, or at least I don't know the others, but I know for a fact that Cloudinary also analyzes the image and based on the analysis of the image, based on the actual content, it will make the decision whether it should do a JPEG or a PNG or a WebP. And then the second level is going to be for the browser, you know, what browser you, you're using to, to open the image. Ooh, okay, um, um, were there any other questions in here? Don't think so. Um, I think it was just uh, some, some conversations. I don't know, does anyone have any questions, additional questions? You can write or even turn on your mic and, and ask whatever fits you better. Just... Mm, just no. Well, uh, we can, if you remember something, um, I suggest we can uh, move on. And if you guys remember of something, we always, we always have um, a bit, um, well, we, before we, we close the, the meetup. So um, let's now go to Rachel Thompson from e-commerce. Uh, she's going to share a bit um, how to use Gatsby, Netlify, and WeCommerce. And Rachel, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, again. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the floor is yours, Rachel. Awesome. Uh, so great to be with you guys. And uh, thank you, Tomas. Uh, that was really great. Like, I actually learned a lot. Um, I haven't used Cloudinary before, so now I'm excited to try it. Um, so, yeah, welcome. Uh, 
to go headless. Uh, this is going to be an app that I'm kind of going to talk through um, and what we've done with Gatsby, Netlify, and BigCommerce. Um, so we're just going to like jump right in uh, to some introductions. So um, I'm Ray. I'm a developer advocate at BigCommerce. Uh, prior to this, I was a quality assurance and test automation engineer for uh, two, three years. Um, and before that, I was a teacher. So I have like a really diverse background, um, but being a developer advocate is like the best thing ever because I get to come talk to you guys and I get to develop really cool things like uh, help with our Gatsby Netlify starter and then get to like share it. So this is uh, one of the more fun aspects of my job is actually getting to come to you guys and show you what, we, what we're building. Uh, if you ever want to reach out, um, my information's here and I'll share the slides after so you guys can have that. Um, and you can always like find me on Twitter, DM me. Um, if you want to be in our developer Slack, just, you know, reach out anytime. Um, happy to add you to our community. Uh, so today we're going to talk first about building headless. Um, with Gatsby and we have basically we have two apps. So we have a base app that is just a base e-commerce app. And then on top of that, we built multi-region support. So you can choose if you want just the base app or if you want multi-region support for like localization um, efforts and all of that. And, you know, one of the cool things about building headless and using the Jamstack is that you are really like engaged in the tech. You choose what is best for you and your team. Um, and you actually can leverage more um, using the Jamstacks. So big commerce and you know the different frameworks, the different API tools, they're all just like little tools you have in your toolkit um, to extend e-commerce or extend any application that you're building. Um, I'm not going to go too heavy into the architecture just because I'm sure you guys are fairly familiar with it. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we found at BigCommerce is that this like traditional monolithic model is just really labor intensive for development teams. And we want to try and move away from that as a company um, to support developers more um, being API driven. So this e-commerce platform exists today um, on BigCommerce to decouple your front end um, and we can act as the e-commerce piece of that technology. Um, so we offer a lot of different things in e-commerce, but the biggest thing I think we offer is that ability to decouple your user experience. Um, and so that's why we say like when you're going headless, you're flipping the model on its head. Um, you get the best of, you know, open SaaS, which is really just like those open APIs, these cloud based um, tools that you can now leverage uh, in the Jamstack and big commerce or a commerce API is one of those pieces, right? Uh, you can be more focused on your user experience. You can do more revenue generating activities um, and not worry about like the maintenance and hosting aspects. And then this is just like some of the fun little things at Big Commerce that we look at. So we really try to be omni-channel. So whether that's web, mobile, tablets, uh, a storefront like your POS system, uh, or your social marketing uh, marketplace. Uh, this is kind of like our, what we consider our wheelhouse is like, we wanna power e-commerce wherever your consumers are. Uh, and then basically like anything else like you can bring in. So you, you maybe you have your own shipping provider or you have your own communications tools. Um, you want to bring in Square or you want to bring in uh, Cloudinary, you know, you want to bring in your own um, different things, you can do that. 
Uh, and this is kind of like our API starter pack. So you have um, GraphQL available. And this example that I'm going to show actually has a lot of GraphQL support. So it does products, product images, variations of products. So just like Tomas was showing with the t-shirts, um, that those would be variations inside of BigCommerce. So it's very similar to that. Um, the custom fields you get, uh, as well as like different categories and brands so that you can be in, as diverse in your catalog of commerce as you want, um, or you can be as simple. So we're really trying to be that provider that can do small and work with you as you grow into an enterprise company. Uh, and we offer some tools to help with that too. Like we have our GraphQL Playground, we have GraphQL Explorer. Um, and then we on the API side, on the REST API side, we have all of these different tools. So we have carts, wish lists, um, we have server to server. So if you wanna keep, uh, if you don't wanna do everything in the front end and you want to have a backend service, you can do that too. Uh, and all of these things have tooling as well on developer.bigcommerce.com. So now we're just going to get into the really fun pieces, which is uh, the app um, and where you can get it, where you can fork it and start playing with it, um, and then creating your own creations. Uh, so this is the basic starter app, and you can kind of see it here demoed in a GIF. Uh, this site was created using Gatsby for the front end. Um, Big Commerce is the e-commerce stack there, and then it's hosted using Netlify. Um, and we actually used Netlify CMS uh, in the few in the second version of this app to do a lot of the translated content management. Uh, this is on GitHub, so you can see the links here. Um, it is originally, I think they originally built this like two years ago, and then I helped do the second iteration with multi-region support. So if we go on here, uh, this is kind of like where you can see the repo, and we built this with the help of a partner, Thern Grove, so I just kind of threw that in the corner so you know um, who helped also build this. Uh, but we are using this base to innovate into multi-region. Um, so you'll see uh, when you go to the to GitHub to fork it, uh, you can actually like pull down the branches and go to the multi-region branch, and that will have the multi-region support. All right. So the headless innovation piece here is really the multi-region support um, because being headless is one thing, um, but then being worldwide is a totally different thing. And it's very hard, um, I think, in a lot of e-commerce to get to that support where people are given what they need in their language of choice. And doing a lot of research and found that you're very likely to lose a sale if you don't cater to someone in their language or you don't cater to someone in their currency that they um, are familiar with because they don't know if they're being swindled or not. There's like a lot of different questions they might have um, regarding their purchase. So multi-region support going forward in headless, I think is just gonna be super common uh, because it really helps people feel like they're part of that experience um, rather than feeling like an outsider of the web. Uh, so here's how we've done it in our front end. Uh, we created a drop down menu of the different regions that we were going to support. So United States, um, United Kingdom and France. And you can see as it goes through um, the United Kingdom shows the currencies in pounds. Um, France shows it in euros. So we're really doing a lot in the big commerce APIs to make this even easier so that you can support people in the regions um, that you're building. 
And a lot of this heavy lifting is done through our channels API, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and that's what's kind of allowing us to leverage the same product images being static as much as possible, um, but then dynamic where we need to be. All right, so in order to do um, multi-language support, we require a channels API. And that channels API is associated to a specific locale uh, in this example, but we've actually created it now to where you could have um, a single locale per channel or multiple locales per channel. Uh, the listing API is used to create the differences in a product listing. So if that product is supported in France, as well as in the United States, you can change what about that product might be inspiring to the French audience and what might be um, more pivotal towards your United States audience. Uh, the catalog API is our <laughs> that's really just like the base of all of big commerce. Um, it gives you products, brands, and categories. Um, and it also manages your products, your variants, and all the metadata that belong to your products. Uh, server to server cart is what will allow you to have a dynamic cart and one that you can control. Um, we do have a storefront cart API, which you could also leverage. However, you won't get the same dynamic currencies um, in a storefront cart. So we do recommend using server to server cart for internationalization purposes. Uh, and that storefront has a customer uh, database system. So you can take that customer information and use storefront login API to log someone into the front end, uh, keep them engaged, uh, you know, sending them emails. Uh, and a lot of this stuff comes with features out of the box that you wouldn't normally see. So uh, if a customer logs in, we can send them transactional emails. We can send them abandoned cart emails if they don't complete a sale. And we can do all of that um, with translation support, either from ourselves internally at BigCommerce or other API providers that you bring in. Uh, and the last one is pricing by channel, and that's our price list API. And it works a lot like the listing API, but just for prices. So um, one thing that you can do is uh, create a channel. It's very, very simple in BigCommerce. So you just really send a raw JSON body as a post. Um, and I'm showing it here in Postman. And I've actually have that Postman request at the bottom. And I actually did a presentation for Next.js conference earlier this week where I did an even better um, Postman request. So I'll include that with all of my materials here today. Um, so that way you guys have a like more robust um, request for channels. Uh, but the, yeah, this, this here is just like a very simple um, channel where we're creating the e-commerce site for France. So we utilized external ID field um, with pipe delimited uh, information in it to create a channel that had everything we needed to serve the front end with the France um, components. So we have here that it's, you know, this, what we want displayed is France. Um, and then the browser, what the browser will need in order to render uh, in French. And then the currency is at the end in euros. And this kind of just goes over that in a little bit more detail, but that's how we really defined the locale using channels was that external ID. Uh, and now we actually have even more fields like you, you don't even have to um, 
anymore, you don't have to include the currency in the external ID. We actually have a currency uh, field on that channels API. So you can just send the currency in. Um, and we, we're doing a lot of work to make this even easier and more functional. So I actually have a update I need to do because that was just delivered yesterday <laughs> um, for the currencies piece. And uh, in the case that where you want to have multiple languages in a region, uh, you can see here that like we have um, English, US, and uh, Spanish US. You can do those on separate channels. And now you could also do that in a single channel um, as we expand those fields and make it um, even more dynamic. Yeah, we can do Spanglish too. Uh, we don't actually do any of the translation. We work with a partner on that, but uh, you could try and do Spanglish on your own if you wanted. Um, I'm from California originally before I moved to Texas. So Spanglish is probably like in my vocabulary somewhere. And uh, we could just, you know, type those in and into the product details and make it work uh, and render to the front end. All right, so um, I'm going to show you th through the BigCommerce control panel UI how you would um, assign a channel uh, products, but you could do this via API very simply. Um, I just figure that like a lot of people are probably new to BigCommerce because we haven't really been um, in the public eye before. Um, so this is kind of maybe newer to some, uh, but yeah, it's, you can do this in the UI, you can do it via API and it's just your choice. Um, so to assign a channel uh, or product to a channel, uh, you would go in and you would see a control um, for channel manager and that is what's that first image at the top it's like those little green active sites um, and you would just want to make sure that your site is active and as soon as you see that your site is active then you can go uh, into the main ui go to your products and you select each product that you want and you click bulk assign and a bulk assign will allow you to choose what channel to place them on. So you actually have um, a great level of detail that you can go into, but you also have like a lot of complexity removed from you as a developer because you can say, hey, I've set up the channel. I see that it's active. Now merchant XYZ, go do your thing and choose where you want these products placed. And you can take that responsibility away from yourself. Or you can say if somebody has like a really complex catalog and maybe they have like 500 plus products or more um, million products, they can just give you their database of products and you can say, okay, well, via API, I'm going to assign these ones to this channel and I'm going to assign these ones to this one. However, it works out, but I do like the fact that merchants can own a lot more of this kind of thing because this is really in their wheelhouse. This is in that marketing wheelhouse and it abstracts you as a developer away from some of that um, where possible. All right, and then our Netlify CMS, uh, we really use this to do a lot of the translation because we didn't have, when we first developed this, we didn't have um, a partner to do a lot of that I18N translation and host those files for us somewhere where we could pull them and um, a quick, easy way to do this was to use a CMS system. And Netlify just happened to be very um, accessible to us. So that's what we chose. And this will actually allow you or your marketing team to take granular control of what is displayed to the UI. So in big commerce, we can host a lot of this, um, but when it comes to that per channel, per view, um, 
you know, the results just show in e-commerce over and over again. Um, the more you can speak to a person in the way that they want to be spoken to, whether that's because they're from uh, Portugal or because they're from, uh, you know, Miami, Florida, uh, you are going to convert more sales and you're going to be more effective um, in your UX and how things are displayed. Uh, when you take that like by region support system and make it, you know, really easy to implement. Um, so here we have, uh, just to kind of like round it out, um, it was just a very simple implementation, but you could see how this could be expanded on exponentially. Uh, and before, you know, I kind of wrap up and finish out this presentation, uh, I just kind of want to let you know that we do know that there's gaps in e-commerce and we do know that there's things that we can optimize and do better. And so I want to talk about a few of those things. Um, and also I would love to hear your guys' perspective on this, um, things that we can always grow on. Um, as a developer community, but like how we can get better at I-18N overall. Uh, so some of the things that I have here, um, translated email and marketing campaign support, uh, it is limited inside of BigCommerce natively. We have partners that help us with this. So this is one of the things that we want to do better and grow on. Um, and have even more partners who support us on this. Uh, multi storefront translations. So um, I said without the CMS, we wouldn't have translations per storefront. Um, and this is one of those areas that we are looking for partner applications to support because uh, it would be really great if there was a CMS system or something that people can go to uh, and update those translations per storefront. Um, and maybe those are partners who are regional, who specialize in doing um, this kind of translation and stuff for a specific region. Um, and that gives them a lot of value. Uh, we're, always optimizing our APIs and one of those is the GraphQL API. So right now it's a um, very limited to that product scope and then you have to use a lot of REST APIs for the channels, etc. But we're looking to expand that so that you can utilize GraphQL more and more throughout your application. And then, you know, there's a lot of other things, but I think we can all agree that testing is a pain point everywhere. And it's definitely a pain point in internationalization just because there's so many little tedious things to look at. Um, so we're actually looking at how we can test these things locally, um, but then growing that into how do we automate some of this testing for internationalization. Uh, and then just kind of at the end here, merchandising, payments and pricing, we want to make sure that that's really simple because um, it's very simple right now for a specific language. But when you get into that multi region support, um, it just kind of breaks down. So we're looking at our, our roadmap over the next year and making these things way more streamlined. So I have a bunch of developer resources for you. Um, if you're interested in taking on a Gatsby project with BigCommerce, um, you know, we have a headless guide, we have multiple clients and um, SDKs available. So uh, all of these things will be provided to you. All right. and. Um, I totally forgot about this slide, but we do have a big dev boot camp. If you're ever um, wanting to learn more about big commerce, 
and become a certified developer with BigCommerce, um, you can feel free just to reach out to me anytime. And uh, I will make sure that we get you hooked up with the right people if you ever want to get these certifications. So that was it. Like that's really how simple um, it can be with BigCommerce to create those Netlify um, sites because it's really just forking our existing one and making it your own with your user experience, your tools, um, and just like plug and play, uh, taking out what doesn't fit for you and putting in what does. So I really am excited to uh, see what you guys have to say. So is there any questions? How? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, can we have some third party integrations like payment gateways? Yes. Um, so Big Commerce has 60 payment, different payment gateways. Um, we have 230, wait, 230 countries, I believe, supported at this time or regions. Um, and then 130 currencies with like our different payment gateways. So yeah, you have a lot of options with big commerce when it comes to payments and payment um, gateways. So we have a lot of those native, um, but our app is actually open to where you could just say, I want to use my own payment gateway um, and plug it in because we have an SDK um, that we're utilizing in the app. So you would just add another layer to that SDK and say, okay, I want to add this payment provider in. Um, and now you just own that PCI compliance, um, which isn't for everyone, but if you know you use the the big commerce supported ones, we actually take on that PCI compliance so you don't have to. Uh, in the headless part, how easy would it be to handle SEO? So the GATS, I will say the Gatsby starters are not as SEO high as our new one that just came out on Tuesday, which is our next commerce starter that we developed with Next um, and Vercel. But um, the SEO piece is there. So there is the meta fields for um, in the head that you can add so that you can you know, increase those SEO scores. Um, image optimization is there to a degree, not as great. Um, but like the next starter, for instance, uses the latest image optimization. So you have that piece there. Um, I will say we do test for lighthouse scores. So both, all of these starters do have baseline lighthouse scores and were developed to have at least minimal um, SEO coverage, um, but it could be improved for sure. Uh, can we use big commerce with some other CMSs like yeah, Drupal? Yes. Uh, Drupal is actually one that we have a starter for as well. So you could take the Gatsby starter and the Drupal starter and um, kind of like mash them together and you know, kind of take some of um, the pieces from that one and the pieces from the Gatsby, however you want to make it work. Uh, and how quick would it be to watch uh, content updates when using this architecture? Uh, the Gatsby one's pretty instant. Um, you just rebuild and you see it uh, happen right away um, because we have a big commerce plugin with Gatsby. Um, you see that happen like super quickly. Uh, the other piece of it though is like with the next starter, you can actually develop everything locally um, because you can pull the environmental variables from Vercel and you will see everything happen like instantaneously. All right. More I questions, think, guys? I'm like, I think I got through them. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Thank you, Gallo. <laughs> 
does anyone have any more questions to Rachel? Don't be shy. Well, okay. Awesome. <laughs> yes, well, I'm, I'll, I'll be online for a little bit longer, guys, if you want to chat with me or if you want to ask me any more stuff, and then I'm going to turn it over to Anna to round this out. Yes. Okay. So thank you, Rachel, again uh, for this thank you. Um, really nice presentation and for sharing this with uh, with us. Um, thank you, also Thomas. Thank you, everyone that is here. I just have uh, a couple of. I'm going to write here on the chat just a couple of links and stuff. But um, if you want to speak, there's a link for the form. Uh, a link also for the recordings, and we are going to share the presentations as well. Um, so I'll ask Rachel and Thomas to send it that to me, and I'll send a message via um, Meetup for everyone so you can have access to the presentation. And well, that's it. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, stay around if you want to chat, turn on your mic. Um, you're welcome to, to, to stay and to chat with Thomas and, and Rachel. And yeah, I'm out. Thank you. <laughs>
Portuguese meetup, right? I, I yeah. have a glass of port. You can't see it because of my background thing. All right. <laughs> trying to, it's, you know. Okay, that's nice. It's already eight Cheers. here. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's Porto wine uh, time. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, exactly. You have to look at the, uh, yeah, you, you don't look at the, the place where you're at when you drink. You always look at the place of yeah. the, you know, producer okay. or the origin of the drink. So in this case, exactly. it works. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that was a rule, but now I, I'm no, glad it, I can follow it. it. is. <laughs> now it is. Now you know. Yes, I'm going to use that. 